The tiles and the grand garden pieces from Minton in the Potteries Museum at Stoke-on-Trent are the showpieces of the heady days of production in this region of England. The Majolica lead glaze ware was for grand exhibitions and houses. The coal and clay of the area were the impetus for drawing these household names to the area and millions of pieces were being produced for the middle classes of Britain and were exported throughout the colonies around the world. The real expansion is in the second half of the 18th century. By that stage the potters are making white wares, cream wares, porcelains, earthenwares, and they're having the clay imported up from Devon, Dorset and Cornwall, but they've still got the coal here and you get this huge expansion from the second half of the 18th century right the way through the 19th century. And all the famous names are established at that point. Wedgwood, Dalton, Minton, the Davenports, Burgesson Lee, scores and scores of factories, many of which of course have now since gone. Well certainly from the early part of the 20th century you've got names like Clarice Cliff, Susie Cooper, Charlotte Reed, and they all went through the local art schools. Old photographs dispel any romantic notions about this hotbed of pottery production. Coal-fired kilns with the heat and dust and dirt jostled with the terraced houses where the workers lived. The Trent and Mersey Canal was the transport lifeline from the traditional five towns of Stoke. The old kilns are still preserved at the old Glaston Factory Museum. Men and boys worked in these, stacking the pots for firing in unbelievable heat. Early deaths were from the pollution, but until then it was a living. But now to our present-day entrepreneurs. This old Wedgwood factory was saved by a woman named Emma Bridgewater. With her husband, she now designs and makes the most modern of wares. She was an English graduate, but always felt she wanted to produce things. She got the opportunity to buy the factory one weekend about 20 years ago. She knew what she wanted to do. It couldn't be simpler. I'm always trying to reproduce the cosy feeling of my mum's kitchen, um, which was very... Um, you know, she made very nice food, but much more important was the fact that there were always lots and lots of people of all ages um, having a nice time there. And it's that feeling of hospitality and friendliness and easy, nice times. Since Josiah Wedgwood, who was a complete genius, Stoke on Trent's basically powered by his huge number of prolific ideas, but creamware, was, which was a refined cream earthenware, um, his invention. I always knew was what I liked best. Inside this old factory, there's no heart of production, but this could be called the dirty end. It's nothing like the conditions of those early days of the last century and before. Hundreds of moulds are made from original worked shapes, and it is these that are used for the pouring of the fine, wet clay. There is a skill in all this. Man and machine have to work together as these bowls are racked up ready for firing to form what is called a biscuit. Bill came back to work here when the factory was revived. We've seen all the new machines come in and all the new machines go back out. So we're back working on now what I started on in 1962. This end is like, I've always seen this end. But the decorating end, you get spellbound when you watch them decorating the stuff when you finish making it. You know, it's, it's an art what some of them do in there. And this is where the art is. Shaped sponges are used to apply the decoration which brings this earthenware to life. This is a fig design. More than 2,000 of these creations are produced every week. In the litho shop, designs by Emma Bridgewater's husband are transferred onto the glazed ware. They're fired in kilns and the colours from the transparency sink into the original glaze. Looking to the other side of town across a demolished industrial landscape lies the old factory of Burgess and Lee, now Burgess, Dorling and Lee. The Trent and Mersey Canal runs at the back where the raw materials came in and pottery went out to the world. The factory was saved from the receivers by a romantic the trademark is Burley, and it produces the distinctive designs on its wide range of household wear by using underglaze transfer printing, which has been in use for more than 200 years. The process starts with the rolling of a special tissue through engraved rollers, which also force the colour into the design. The patterns are cut from the tissue, and applying them is a painstaking and repetitive process. 
The final part of the fixing is done with a brush and soap, and then the decorated biscuit is washed, which removes the excess tissue, leaving the colour pattern in place. This order is for William Sonoma in the United States. We had a shop in Winchester and 70% of our turnover was from this factory. So we were devastated when we heard they'd gone into receivership. So, so we started campaigning. We knew what a treasure it was. And it was like a time capsule. You know, we, we campaigned, we wrote to the National Trust and English Heritage and Prince Charles to see if somebody would, could do something. And uh, the, nobody uh, could help at that time. And, at the 11th hour, we had to do it ourselves. And um, it's been it was quite a challenge moving from retail to manufacturing. These are some of the distinctive blue and white products that have become synonymous with Berlin. The American order came from another Stoke factory, which had outsourced the manufacturing abroad. It's worth £120,000, with more to come. Along the canal is a very different operation. Steelite International is formed out of an old Dalton factory. It is now modern and massive, with a turnover of £52 million pounds a year, making vitrified, toughened tableware for hotels and restaurants. It has three of these kilns working virtually day and night as the different shapes and sizes are fed in from racks by machinery. Each plate is suspended on pins one above the other to give a complete non-scuffed glazed firing to the base. Banks of robots keep the human hand that feeds them up to scratch as they dip and shake off the glaze before firing. From our manufacturing base here in Stoke-on-Trent, um, you know we've um, we've been able to expand uh, the product worldwide uh, to a point that we we now sell to over 130 different countries worldwide. Uh, our product sits on the tabletops of ocean liners, uh, uh, fine dining restaurants, uh, casinos, resorts, uh, roadside restaurants, uh, hospitals. I mean the whole gamut of uh, food service industry throughout the world. These are some of the products that will also end up in a new distribution centre in Pittsburgh. The senior designer will interpret what the client wants as she travels the world. We spend a lot of time in Las Vegas with some of the major hotel groups like um, the MGM Grand for instance which owns quite a few hotels there which obviously we within each casino there's 14 or 15 restaurants. These exquisite products are from the Anita Harris studio an altogether different operation with just seven employees. These magnificent vases and dishes and items for display are created in reactive glazes which produce this vibrant finish when fired. The shapes are again produced by hand casting or in moulds from slip or liquid clay. The moulds take up the moisture before being broken open for the first firing. The base colouring is sprayed on before the artists get to work. Anita, on the right, was at the pool works and then Cobridge before they went out of business. She brought her other artists with her to the new studio in this old tram depot. This one's called Golden Peacock and here's a the final piece after it's gone through the kiln um, and as you can see from what I'm painting there's no resemblance whatsoever to the final piece every time you open that kiln door you're never absolutely certain how it's going to be so there's always that excitement with working with these reactive glazes and I feel quite like privileged really and, and proud that uh, we're here and doing what we're doing today oh it's absolutely lovely I'd much rather it like this I mean a lot of places are now um, producing abroad and stuff, but I think it's really good to keep it in stoke and keep the hand painting tradition going. Producing pots from clay has almost been moulded into the human DNA, and the forefathers of the modern potters will be proud of the way they are forging ahead with their different forms of ceramic production in Stoke-on-Trent. They have picked up and enhanced the old skills for the 21st century. They are producing the craft antiques of the future.